Okay, are you ready? <laughs> yes. So, um, I don't know if uh, Ian was telling you yesterday, in Parkinson's disease, we see these um, enhanced beta oscillations in the motor cortex. Yes. And so what we've gone away and done after doing those um, human studies where we've given Zolpidem and we've seen a reduction in these beta oscillations mm-hmm. and an improvement in um, cognitive and motor function. So what we've gone away in um, the rat brain model uh, in vitro slices, we... Um, we've modelled what we think is happening yes. and so um, what we do is get these slices of motor cortex and um, we look for the beta oscillations and so that's what um, these are showing you here so we've got these um, nice beta oscillations and then the modulation by Zolpidem and so at these um, low doses of Zolpidem is what we think we're seeing in the human, in the human studies that we've done yes. and so we've gone away and we've asked so why at one concentration is Zolpidem decreasing these oscillations and at higher doses is it um, increasing these oscillations? So what we've gone away and done is look at um, single cell studies. So we do this technique called whole cell patch clamping where we attach an electrode to individual cells uh-huh. and then um, we can see what's going on in the membrane okay. of those cells. So um, in layman's terms, there's these... Um, two types of inhibition, there's phasic and tonic inhibition, and so phasic is what's um, occurring straight away, it just occurs when there's an event at a synapse, whereas tonic inhibition is ongoing and it's um, independent from the synapse, so um, what we see is there's um, not actually a change with inhibition at the synapse, Mm -hmm. but there's this greater ongoing change in inhibition called tonic inhibition, so what we're seeing here is this is a cell just plodding along, doing its job. Yes. And then when we add zolpidem, it increases the tonic inhibition. And so we think that what it, this is doing is basically taking these cells out of the network. And so it's disrupting the oscillations in okay. the motor cortex. And so we think that's what um, is happening in Parkinson's disease. Mm-hmm. And uh, so um, we know it's specific. So there's two types of cells as well. So there's um, excitatory cells and um, inhibitory cells. And this only occurs in the inhibitory cells. And so we've shown... And that's related to GABA somehow. Yes, yeah? that's it. Is that correct? Yeah, so GABA is the um, transmitter for inhibition, basically. And if it's over... If, and the if dopaminergic... Uh, uh, Receptors are, are, the, are the opposite of the GABA, right? Uh, well, kind of, they're just a different type <laughs> yeah. of receptor. And so um, what we've shown basically is that this happens in a specific type of inhibitory cell, yes. but you can't see it in these um, excitatory cells. And so this is why we think, because um, um, FS cells or fast spiking cells have been shown to be one of the major players in um, these um, networks of oscillation generation. And so we think by taking away these individual cells, it's what's disrupting the oscillation. And so that's how we can then see the, the decrease in the pathological beta oscillations. So it, so it still works on the level of, uh, of uh, neurotransmitters. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and, the, and so the beta oscillations are kind of a, a side effect correlate that you can measure that's related to, to the activity of these uh, inhibitory and excitatory cells. Yes, Acti- so, um, activation. Well, that, that's what we've um, seen a correlation in. We can't show it, and we haven't shown it together quite yet because it's quite difficult to do both at the same time. So um, that's maybe one of our next steps. To uh, see what's going on, but we've shown like um, we've shown them separately, and so hopefully now we can show them together and say so. This is definitely what's happening. I see, and and so you say that it's uh, subsedative levels of zolpidem mm-hmm. that are so uh, that are ha- having the. Uh, beneficial effect of like blocking the beta yeah, that's it. oscillation, so, um, and if you if you if you supply a higher dose, then it's the disadvantageous effect. Mm-hmm, that's it. You're and saying? at higher doses, it'll send you to sleep anyway. So mm-hmm. <laughs> there's been no use this all. And, and can you comment on whether it's viable? You think that on the sub such a sub sedative levels, if it's kind of safe on the long term to give to patients. I mean, safe probably it is, but in the sense of uh, side effects that mm-hmm. are expected from a sleeping pill, it's, is, it's, <laughs> is it still kind of viable? Well, that's it. I mean, obviously people take it as a, a sleeping tablet, and um, you're not supposed to give it long term as a sleeping tablet, but at these low doses, um, people that we've worked with, um, I think, uh, still use it and they still see the benefits from it, but um, we haven't done any long, long-term uh, studies on it yet, so that's obviously needs to go into clinical trials. Yeah, sure. 
viable sure. as a treatment option. Do you, can you can you estimate like how lasting the effect of this? Um, uh, so you have to um, you'd have to keep taking it. So um, it depends on like the harvest of the drug. So you'd have to take the um, the dose like uh, three or four times a day, maybe not quite ah, so often. Okay. And then when it okay. actually helps like the sleep problems that can come with okay. um, Parkinson's as well. So it can ah, be beneficial. So it helps sleep better at night as well as having the beneficial effects of the motor and cognitive during the day. What's your plan for the next phase? of this research if um, you have any so on what i'm doing at the moment is actually we're doing a longer term study in a pd patients so we're giving them zolpidem and other types of um, benzodiazepines as well to see why this occurs with zolpidem and other sorts of um, benzodiazepines okay so. thank you very much okay. <laughs>